one to discuss immunologic emergencies. The information that I'm going to be uh, going over today comes from Nancy Caroline's Emergency Care in the Streets, 8th edition, uh, chapter 25. The main things that paramedics are going to be responsible for and treat in immunologic emergencies are going to be allergic reactions with the potential for anaphylactic reactions. Now, there are other immunologic disorders and immunologic issues that the paramedic may see, but this is going to be the situation where you have the highest incidence of treatment, and there's a lot at stake when it comes to identifying allergic reactions versus uh, anaphylactic reactions. Uh, simple allergic reactions uh, can result in life-threatening anaphylactic reaction if not treated. Depends on the body's response to the allergen or the antigen. Nonetheless, the biggest issues that you will be faced with when it comes to anaphylactic reaction is, of course, anaphylactic shock, uh, uh, hemodynamic uh, compromise, and airway compromise. With airway being the most important, you need to be prepared to treat acute airway obstruction um, very quickly and cardiovascular collapse. Uh, you, you've got to be able to distinguish between a regular response and an allergic reaction because the body will have certain responses to things that are not necessarily allergic reaction. The incidence of anaphylaxis is low. Less than 6% of the U.S. population has experienced an anaphylactic reaction, with the majority of the anaphylactic incidence being due to medications, foods, and insect stings in that order. You should be able to distinguish between the body's usual response to a sting or a bite and symptoms of an allergic reaction. The immune response uh, problems include hypersensitivity, allergic reactions, anaphylaxis, biphasic allergic reactions, anaphylactoid reactions, collagen vascular diseases, and transplant-related disorders. When we deal with patients or take care of patients that have a anaphylactic reaction or an allergic reaction, essentially it is, is an exaggerated response by the immune system to a foreign substance. Something very interesting here is that immunolo immunologists discovered anaphylaxis in the early 1900s while attempting to immunize dogs against a deadly sea anemone. Anaphylaxis results from exposure to a particular substance that sets off a biochemical chain of events that can ultimately lead to shock and death. The immune system is a very complicated uh, body system responsible for combating infection, has components all over the body. The body protects itself through two types of systems. You have cellular immunity, which is cell-mediated immunity. And in this situation, the body produces T cells to attack and destroy invaders. Then you have humoral immunity, where B cell lymphocytes produce antibodies that dissolve in the plasma and lymph to attack foreign organisms. The cells that produce immunity are found in the lymph nodes, the spleen, and the GI tract. The goal is to intercept foreign organisms as they enter the body. Under normal circumstances, this is awesome. This is what keeps us alive. This is what keeps the antigens and the foreign sub, uh, organisms from killing the human body. However, whenever the uh, immune response is exaggerated, it causes some severe issues. A couple of terms here. An allergen is a substance that produces allergic symptoms. This is usually harmless. Uh, examples are a lot of food uh, allergens, such as eggs, peanuts, things like that. Um, but then there's other things, drugs, uh, antibiotics, penicillin reactions being some of the more common allergic reactions. An antibody is a protein produced by the body in response to an antigen. It's seen as a globulin or a immunoglobulin, which is in the plasma. IgE, which is a type of antibody that is present in minute amounts in the body, 
but it plays a major role in allergic diseases, is the primary antibody responsible for allergic reactions. IgE binds to allergens and triggers a release of substances from mast cells that can cause inflammation. The immune system's reaction to foreign substances is localized or systemic. A localized reaction is going to be limited to a specific area, so you would know signs and symptoms from that. Swelling around an insect bite, redness, um, things like that, whereas a systemic reaction occurs throughout the body and, and it affects many uh, body systems. Swelling hives all over the body after ingestion of an allergen is an example. Then you have hypersensitivity, which is an inappropriate response to a substance body perceives as harmful. Hypersensitivity occurs when a person's immune system reacts with exaggerated or inappropriate allergic symptoms from a substance the body perceives as harmful. There's four types of responses. You have an allergic reaction, which is an abnormal immune response that the body develops when the person has been previously exposed or sensitized to a substance or allergen. Now, this is important because... You need to remember that the body has to be exposed typically to the antigen and then the, the cells through uh, immunity uh, will form a memory of that particular antigen and then the next time the body is exposed to that particular antigen, that's when you will see the allergic reaction. Typically, you don't see the allergic reaction after the first exposure. This isn't always the case, but... This is typically what happens. Uh, anaphylaxis is an extreme allergic reaction involving two or more body systems. This is life-threatening. Also, a biphasic reaction is a two-phase allergic reaction in which the patient's symptoms, they improve and then reappear within secondary exposure to the trigger. Then you may have what's called a prolonged or persistent reaction where anaphylaxis symptoms uh, continue over time from 5 to 72 hours. An anaphylactoid reaction does not involve the IgE antibody mediation, but essentially the patient presents as the same um, for anaphylaxis. Oftentimes, anaphylactoid reactions are caused uh, through contrast dye, morphine, derivative medications, and aspirin. As far as routes of entry for allergens, you have injection, absorption, inhalation, and ingestion. Injection uh, is a situation in which the substance pierces the skin and deposits foreign material. This is uh, how bees and hornets, uh, that's how the antigens from them uh, enter the body. occurs when foreign material is solely absorbed through the skin. This occurs when you have certain creams or um, lotions, things like that. Um, when it uh, gets into the system. Absorption can also occur through the vaginal Instances of anaphylactic response to seminal fluid have been documented, so asking about recent sexual activity may be necessary. The issue here is that the invasion by the allergens does not stop at the skin. The substances may also enter the respiratory tract as the patient quietly breathes. This is referred to as inhalation exposure. Inhalation exposure uh, 
occurs when the foreign substances advance through the respiratory system to the lungs. Example includes pet hair, dander, peanuts, things like that. Many plants are also involved in this type of exposure. And then the final way is through the GI tract uh, via ingestion. Although it's estimated that millions of Americans are at risk for anaphylaxis, no exact cause or route of exposure or entry for uh, this life-threatening event can be determined in up to two-thirds of the patients. Furthermore, no one route of exposure is identified as having a greater risk of anaphylaxis. They all are very dangerous. So what exactly happens during the immune reaction? What is the physiology of the immune reaction? Well, the body initiates a series of responses when a foreign substance enters. You have what's called the primary response. This is going to be when the macrophages confront and engulf the invading body substance or the invading substance. If the body cannot identify the substance, the immune cells record the features of the outside substance and design specific proteins to match each substance. These proteins are called antibodies and they're intended to match the foreign substance and inactivate it. The body actually creates these and stores them so that anytime that that particular antigen um, enters the cell, then those memory cells or the antibodies will match with the antigen that, is, that they are particular to and they will inactivate it. The body then develops sensitivity, the ability to recognize a foreign substance when it is encountered again is very, very important for the body to fight this antigen. It distributes the details to the rest of the body by placing the antibodies on basophils, which are found in specific sites within the tissues, and mast cells, which are found in connective tissues, bronchi, gastrointestinal mucosa, and other border areas. Mast cells are often released as a result of the antigen invading the body. Basophils and mast cells produce chemical mediators to fight the antigens. Uh, these chemical mediators contain granules filled with powerful substances to fight the antigens. The granules remain inactive until the body is invaded by a previously identified foreign substance. If an antigen enters the body and combines with one of the antibodies, the granules are detonated and the chemical mediators are released into the surrounding tissue and the bloodstream. The chemical mediators begin and maintain the immune response. They summon more white blood cells to the area. They increase blood flow by dilating the blood vessels and increasing capillary permeability in the area. While this is useful in a limited area, if it's spread throughout the body, it could cause some severe systemic effects, have anaphylaxis. And this is one of the reasons due to the uh, dilation of the blood vessels and increasing permeability of the capillaries that you see the uh, hypotension that is related to an anaphylactic reaction. So as we move forward into these situations, it's very, very important that if you're in a situation where you suspect an allergic reaction has occurred, you need to assess your scene. Whether you are allergic to that particular substance, uh, such as a bee sting or, or something like that, um, whether you are allergic to it or not, it doesn't matter because it could still be very harmful to you. Um, so you always need to be aware of your surroundings. Determine the nature of the illness. Look for potential exposures. Look for uh, ways that you yourself could actually be uh, injured. The allergic symptoms are varied as, as the allergens are varied as well. Um, you want to always do your primary assessment. 
uh, your level of consciousness, your respiratory system, circulatory system, mental status, and skin. What you're going to do in this situation, though, is you're going to have to determine if they are having an allergic reaction. You've got to determine, is it mild, moderate, or severe? Severe is going to be life-threatening, but you will have specific actions that you would take for each one to prevent it from going uh, to the next step. So oftentimes with mild allergic reactions, we may just monitor uh, if we notice that the local area is starting to spread or we start seeing hives or things like that, then we may consider giving Benadryl. Uh, once we start seeing mild signs spread throughout the body, then we're going to want to go ahead and move towards uh, epinephrine if we uh, especially start seeing uh, vital signs changing, blood pressure decreasing, uh, respiratory issues, things like that. And then, of course, with anaphylactic reactions, we may have to be full-blown support mode. These reactions in the severe anaphylactic reactions are systemic. An example, congestion that progresses to respiratory distress and hypotension, and it may be a sudden onset. One thing that you do need to remember is that when you have airway uh, issues in anaphylaxis, they could become very bad very, very quickly. So you want to absolutely manage those first. Also, form your general impression. Is this patient sick or not sick? But you need to understand that this situation, this patient is dynamic and they could certainly go from stable to unstable very, very quickly. Listen for those sounds of a noisy upper airway. A noisy upper airway. This is going to be strider and hoarseness. The patient may report tightness in the throat. Lung sounds are a predictor of severity. And as hypoventilation begins, there will be diminished lung sounds. Silence in, in the presence of previous is, is a really bad sign. You would much rather hear wheezing than silence. You need to be prepared to manage this patient's airway very, very quickly. Evaluate the skin for histamine relief symptoms. These are going to be unique. Uh, erythema, edema, pruritus, which is going to be itching, and then uticaria, which is going to be hives. As you can see in these images here, these are both examples of uh, uticaria, diffuse hives all over the body. Recognize shock early and initiate treatment immediately. And then, of course, your transport decision is going to be based on your patient's severity and the signs symptoms in which the patient is having. Even if the patient reports that they are feeling better after treatment, they certainly should be rechecked because of the potential for them to have another secondary reaction, as mentioned with the biphasic reaction. Your history taken should be directed at the current complaint. Absolutely. Do you want to ask if they have allergies? Why wouldn't you? Have they ever had an allergic reaction? Have you ever experienced this before? How does this incident compare? Did you die last time? If you died last time, this is certainly serious. How about medications? Have you uh, taken any interventions? Uh, so not only are you going to ask um, what medications they currently are, are on, but you also want to ask, you know, have you already tried to take some Benadryl? Do you have an EPN or something like that? Determine if the treatment was administered. EpiPen, Benadryl, a beta agonist inhaler such as albuterol, or an aeros aerosolized epinephrine. Some EpiPens have two doses. Don't discard the second dose. Ask about less common causes of anaphylaxis, such as exercise-induced reactions or seminal fluid reactions, such as what I mentioned earlier. During your secondary assessment, evaluate the respiratory system. Assess the circulatory system and look for signs and systems of systemic reaction. Now, this is after you've already made it through your primary assessment. Anaphylaxis, anaphylaxis 
presents with respiratory symptoms and hypotension. GI symptoms, abnormal cramping, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea may be present. If symptoms are life-threatening, perform secondary assessment after life threats are addressed and you are en route to the hospital. The assessment may direct treatment and should include a systematic head-to-toe or focus assessment. Evaluate the respiratory system. Look for signs and symptoms of increased work of breathing, accessory muscles, head bobbing, tripod positioning, nostril flaring, grunting. Also listening for your upper airway and lower airway sounds such as strider and wheezing. Assess for hemodynamic compromise within the circulatory system. This includes your blood pressure, pulse rate, cardiac monitoring, and pulse oximetry. Hypoperfusion or respiratory distress indicates the allergic reaction may be severe enough to cause death. Look for the, the signs such as hives, rash, swelling, signs of a reaction source. Ask the patient about a reaction source. Rapidly spreading rash, hot skin, and altered mental status. Assess your baseline vital signs. You're particularly looking for things that are going to indicate anaphylaxis, low blood pressure, a difficulty breathing, um, decreased SpO2, things like that. This would be a great time to monitor end tidal CO2, listening for bronchoconstriction. Um, one of the things that you may hear is wheezing, which occurs when excessive fluid and mucus are secreted into the bronchial passages. The muscles around the passages tighten because of the release of histamines and leukotrienes induced by the allergen. So essentially, the body is trying to shut the, the airways down so that any, no more of the allergen can get in. It's not a very efficient way to stay alive, though. Breathing becomes more difficult, and the patient may stop breathing. Now, you do need to be able to differentiate between the strider, which is upper airway, and the wheezing, which is lower airway. Strider occurs when swelling in the upper airway closes off the airway and can lead to total obstruction. Treatment's different. Now, I do mention this sometimes, um, that you're not going to give albuterol for strider. You may want to consider racemic epinephrine. And also, just as a little FYI, glucagon has been shown to reduce uh, laryngeal edema as well in the past, but it is not part of your standard of care. Now remember with your entitled CO2, you're going to have the shark fin type waveform whenever you have wheezing. This is part of the bronchoconstriction, so this will be a great way for you to monitor that. Your reassessment obviously should be done in route, focusing on uh, signs and symptoms of increasing um, airway and hemodynamic compromise. You want to recheck your interventions. Always, if you've given an intervention, you want to recheck. That's why you got your baseline vital. Couple of things you want to figure out. How much distress is the patient experiencing? Because if the patient is experiencing anaphylactic reaction, you want to get early epinephrine administration. Early, early epinephrine administration is going to be very important to help slow the progression of anaphylaxis. What does epi do? Epi helps open up the airways and it helps vasoconstrict the peripheral vessels so hopefully it's going to help keep the blood pressure up and the airways open severe reactions require ventilatory support and or fluid resuscitation you definitely want to understand that once you start losing your airway it's going to go very very quickly moderate reactions may require only supportive care in either situation the patient should be transported to a medical facility for further evaluation. This is a video that for time's sake, I'm not going to play while I'm recording, but this is actually posted on your canvas under the anaphylactic or the immune module. So please take a moment to uh, view that. 
So moving on into the actual pathophysiology of anaphylactic reaction, essentially the immune system becomes hypersensitive um, and it becomes very destructive. You ever met anybody that's hypersensitive? Uh, they really just kind of shut everything down, don't they? It's kind of the same way with the immune system. When it becomes hypersensitive, it just shuts it all down. Uh, trying to make a joke, it's not very easy when you're sitting in an office instead of standing in front of you guys. I sure do miss you. Um, the immune system becomes hypersensitive to one or more substances that should not be defined as harmful. The immune cells of the allergic person are more sensitive than those of a person without allergies, and this becomes a threat to that person. When an invading substance enters the body, the mast cells release chemical mediators. Histamine causes the local blood vessels to dilate and the capillaries to leak. Then you have these substances called leukotrienes, which cause additional dilation and leaking. Leukotrienes are actually much more potent than histamine. White blood cells help engulf and destroy the antigen, and the platelets begin to uh, collect and clump together. In anaphylaxis, the effect of the chemical mediators involves more than one body system. An initial effect may be followed by secondary effects a few hours later, um, or a biphasic reaction. Histamine causes vasodilation, vascular permeability, smooth muscle contraction, and decreased effects of the heart. Immediate vasodil vasodilation often presents as uh, red skin, hypotension, vascular permeability results in edema, fluid uh, secretion and fluid loss. Edema can present as eutocaria, airway constriction, and increased fluids in the airway. So muscle contraction in the respiratory and the GI system results in laryngospasm, bronchospasm, and abdominal cramping. You also have decrease in the inotropic or the contractile effects of the heart. When coupled with vasodilation, this may lead to profound hypotension. Dysrhythmias are often due to hypoperfusion and hypoxia. These are often very common once you get into the later effects of the um, histamine release in the anaphylactic reaction. Histamine has uh, a couple of different receptor sites. You've got your H1, your H2, H3, and H4. We particularly talk about the H1 and the H2 uh, receptor sites. Your H1 is particularly where the acute allergic reactions in the smooth muscle. Um, and then your H2 is your GI effects. Histamine releases or to block the effects of the histamine. A drug like Benadryl is particularly um, useful because it is a non-selective. So it works on H1 and H2 receptor cells, whereas something like Tagamet, uh, which you think of uh, given for GI issues, uh, it is particularly H2, but it can be used in um, anaphylactic reaction as well. Then you have leukotrienes, which compound the effects of histamine, causes the issues to become even more higher. You've got coronary vasoconstriction, which in, uh, uh, contributes to a worsening cardiac condition and myocardial irritability. You've got increased vascular permeability, which increases the uh, um, hypoperfusion. Um, respiratory system becomes more dire. Once these leukotrienes start to um, be released, you, you're running into some big issues. Like I mentioned earlier, leukotrienes are 100 times more potent than histamine. When you are expecting to treat a patient with uh, shock, um, anaphylactic shock, you should expect signs and symptoms of cardiogenic shock due to what we just mentioned, the decrease in cardiac function, um, hypovolemic shock due to the vascular uh, permeability, uh, the movement of fluids, and then neurogenic as well because it is a type of distributive shock.
Clinical symptoms of anaphylaxis. Skin symptoms are often the first indications of anaphylaxis and may include uh, the itching, um, the feeling of being warm and flushed, vasodilation, capillary leaking area um, around the eyes is especially susceptible, uh, swelling of the face and tongue, which is also known as angioedema. This is often seen in ACE inhibitor um, reactions. Edema of the hands and feet, eutychia from histamine release or hives. Um, respiratory, shortness of breath, tightness or a lump in the throat or, uh, and chest, strider and hoarseness. They may progress slowly or very rapidly. Cardiovascular symptoms or serious complications. Histamine and leukotriene uh, decrease the contra contractility of the heart, resulting in a decrease in cardiac output. Oh, wow, it led back to cardiac output which then is complicated by vasodilation, increased capillary permeability, per, uh, perfusion issues, include uh, decreasing of perfusion, leading to ischemia and potential cardiac dysrhythmias, fluid leaks from the capillaries, as much as 50% of the vascular volume can be lost within 10 minutes of exposure and never even leak into the outside of the body. Blood vessels dilate, making the vascular volume totally inadequate and causing hypotension. GI symptoms, nausea, bloating, vomiting, cramping, central nervous system, headache, dizziness, confusion, sense of impending doom. This especially requires rapid assessment and treatment. And again, the cogenic shock due to decreased cardiac output, hypovolemic shock due to leaking fluids, and neurogenic shock due to the inability of blood vessels to constrict. You need to be able to rapidly differentiate between anaphylaxis and other conditions, such as the things that are uh, listed here. Don't delay transport or treatment for a more complete diagnosis. If you need to treat, treat. Signs of allergic reaction without respiratory distress, these are going to fall into the mild to early moderate. Uh, this is going to be treated with diphenhydramine or Benadryl. Now remember that antihistamine medications do not, do not um, stop the release of histamine, they just block the effect of histamine. Patients who are unstable, um, you need to obviously get them away from the offending agent, then prepare to uh, treat with more invasive uh, treatments. Main your airway. This is an example of Strider. Administer supplemental oxygen. Early administration of epinephrine should be a priority because this is going to be the drug of choice when it comes to this. As far as epinephrine, I am in the thighs are out of choice. Don't delay administration. I am administration in the anterior lateral thighs, the drug and route choice. You, you, you prefer IM dose over sub Q dose. If there's no response to the IM doses, you can administer. An IV infusion of epinephrine in conjunction with the IV fluid bolus to help support hemodynamic uh, status. Um, also, an IV bolus of epinephrine is within the realm of possibilities. This is going to be a 1 to 10,000 concentration, and it's going to be a 0 0.1 to 0 0.35 milligrams in adults or 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram in children. You want to maintain circulation, IV fluids. Why? Because the uh, IV fluids are going to fill the vascular space where the fluids have already been lost through the vascular permeability. So again, these are just examples of the drugs. Um, administer high flow uh, O2. This is okay in these situations epinephrine, antihistamines, anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressant agents, and a vasopressor. The antihistamine administration should be considered only in the patient with a mild reaction or after epi has been administered. So your, your progression of drugs is always going to be epinephrine if you start seeing reactions that start to affect blood pressure and uh, airway. 
Antihistamines block the H1 and the H2 receptor sites, such as what I mentioned. And uh, Benadryl is a non-selective H1 and H2. Corticosteroids have been used uh, for anaphylaxis, such as solumedrol. Inhaled beta adrenergic agents, such as albuterol, may be used if bronchospasm is present. Many patients will benefit from the addition of albuterol in the conjunction with epinephrine. Maintain a supine position for patients in anaphylaxis with hypotension and then with respiratory distress, continually reassess the airway. Emotional support is also very crucial, um, which is one of the areas that I struggle in, but we, uh, as professionals, we want to always provide emotional support. And then consider early transport if the patient needs resources you cannot give. And even if the action has stopped, you want to uh, take the patient be to the hospital because as many as 20% of patients will have symptom re recurrence within the next eight hours. So, Moving on, uh, we're just going to briefly talk about some autoimmune disorders and collagen vascular diseases. In an autoimmune disorder, the immune system inappropriately attacks its own host tissue, things like rheumatoid arthritis, things like that. In uh, collagen vascular diseases, the body perceives its own collagen tissue as a dangerous invader and excess that tissue. This attack can be chronic, causing long-term infl inflammation or severe enough to result in death. Here is a list of autoimmune disorders and conditions. The list is very long. So to talk about a couple of these disorders, you've got systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE, or um, for me, I'm going to call it lupus. Um, Multi-system autoimmune disease that affects the entire body uh, may result in rheumatologic problems, such as uh, joint problems. It's also more common in women than men. Suspect in women of childbearing age with fever, rash, and joint pain. Care should be directed at monitoring for life threats, and the patients may be on immunosuppressive medications. Slight changes should alert you to treat aggressively if needed. Scleroderma is an autoimmune connective tissue disease that causes fibrotic changes to the skin, blood vessels, muscles, and internal organs. Presents with tightening thickening and scarring of the skin and may include symptoms of Raynaud phenomenon, which is pain, blanching, cyanosis, or redness of fingers and toes from stress or cold exposure. Stiffness of lungs and blood vessels result in pulmonary fibrosis and pulmonary hypertension. Renal damage may result in hypertension and renal crisis, and damage to the heart muscle is a major complication. Assess for dysrhythmias, palpitations, and congestive heart failure. Pulmonary complications are the most common cause of death in scleroderma patients. Renal crisis is a major concern as well. Um, you're certainly going to treat uh, any type of life threats, monitor for signs of infections. Organ transplant disorders. Often these patients are, or always these patients are on um, anti-rejection medications. Uh, these medications put the patient at a greater risk for an infection because they cause the immune system to not recognize other threats. It's important to address priorities in caring for specific transplanted organs. Um, with a heart transplant, the recipient's heart is usually removed and replaced with a donor heart. In these cases, atropine is not going to be indicated because typically the normal electrical conduction system is not going to be be there. Um, the recipient's heart is usually removed, replaced with the donor heart, and an ECG may show tachycardia at the rate of 100 to 110 beats per minute because of denervation of the vagus nerve. The denervated heart cannot generate anginolate pain, so chest pain is uncommon. A patient with ischemia tends to show signs of congestive heart failure or dysrhythmias. Again, atropine is not aided because the implanted heart does not have vagus nerve innervations and will not respond to the atropine's vagolytic action. Sympathomimetic drugs often work well. Antihypertensive medications tend to work for hypertension, and norepi 
and isoproteranol may have a slightly increased response. Most of the time, rejections in heart transplant occurs within the first three months. Signs and symptoms are subtle, and they may require a biopsy to confirm. Dysrhythmias have also been associated with rejection. When looking for indication of infection, assess for the typical signs, fever, shortness of breath, and hypotension. In a liver transplant, the loss of function of the liver causes rapid deterioration. Observe for jaundice. Also look for uh, tenderness over the site. Monitor for signs of hyperkalemia, such as a tall peaked T wave. With kidney transplant, infection is a major concern. The recipients tend to develop hepatitis C and later liver disease. Um, observe uh, of the site for infection. Auscultate for development of a brewery and evaluation of other signs of infection. You got three types of lung transplant, bilateral, unilateral, and lobar. It's very important to determine what type uh, that patient has had. Um, signs of rejection may include cough, dyspnea, and obviously severe respiratory distress. Hemothorax is an early complication of lung transplant, and infection presents with the same signs of rejection and requires immediate intervention. Pancreas uh, transplant has way more complications and a lower survival rate at one year than other single organ transplants. Most are done on diabetics and are often performed with kidney transplants. A route to drain the exocrine component must be placed and usually drained into the intestine or bladder leading to urinary tract infections and symptoms such as infection and hematuria. The bicarbonate produced by the pancreas is drained into the bladder, often causing chronic non-anion gap acidosis and the patient may have to take bicarbonate supplements. Infection and rejection are very common problems. Be aware of the subtle signs and symptoms. Um, definitely want to get a good history. Your management is going to be um, getting a good history, making sure you have all the medications, um, getting as much information as possible for the ER, and then uh, understanding how the medications will interact and how they will be metabolized, um, and then treating signs and symptoms. Missing even one dose of immunosuppressive medications is an emergency and can cause some pretty severe issues for that patient. As far as our role in patient education, um, I would hope that if a person knows that they are allergic to something, they have been very well ed uh, educated. Um, now, just remember in some situations, the first time that person has the allergic reaction after they've had the initial encounter may be um, when you first see them. Obviously, if you can be able to uh, identify the antigen, that will certainly help them with um, education there and understanding what's going to happen. One of your big responsibilities, though, is this possibility of biphasic reaction. If a person has an anaphylactic reaction, even if it's uh, on the milder uh, side, you should certainly um, get them to be um, transported for evaluation at the hospital. And then, of course, um, the others, uh, you can read this here, encourage self-monitoring, consult a physician for taking new medication. All of this is most likely not going to be educated by the paramedic. It's going to be educated by the physician. As always, you can contact me at nickray at suscc.edu. Um, if you've got any questions, I will be glad to help you out. Please let me know. Thanks.